It's not easy for us busy geotechnical engineers to keep up with industry trends while keeping up with our engineering work. Therefore, it's our goal at the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast can help you do just that. We strive to keep our listeners informed on important industry topics and also to educate you on interesting technical topics and trends in the geotechnical world. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I'll be talking with Andrew Lees, PhD, MICE, CNG. He's the director of GeoFem and also the global application technology manager at Tensar International. And he's a visiting research fellow at the University of Southampton. We'll be talking to him about FEA, geogrid stabilization, and NSAR, and also what the future looks like for geotechnical engineering. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I'm excited to be bringing you another episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. Before we go on here, I'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, Tensar International. Here's a message from Tensar about their award-winning software, Tensar Plus, which is available to you at no cost. Check out Tensar Plus, the award-winning design software for construction professionals to design with geosynthetics and calculate their value on projects. Tensar Plus is simple to use with a powerful engineering system at its core. It leverages our decades of research and experience with soils all over the world, so you can count on your solutions working the first time, even in the most difficult conditions. Whether you're designing a crane pad or need to build a temporary road over muck, the cost, time, and carbon savings can be calculated, making comparison with alternatives simple. Specs, reports, and product data can be generated for your design, and Training resources, research, and our third-party expert reviews are all provided conveniently in the software if needed. Usable both online and offline, the app is available in browser and on all major mobile platforms. Whatever you're working on, Tensar Plus is your toolbox for success. Welcome to the show, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thanks, Jared. It's great to meet you, and thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's good to put a name to a face to a voice, and we're glad to have you here. Uh, Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself and what is it that you do on a daily basis? Sure. Um, So let's see. It started with uh, studying civil engineering, and then um, I did postgraduate study. I did a PhD in geotechnical engineering, actually in the field of soil structure interaction using centrifuge modeling and uh, FEA, finite element analysis. Um, After that, worked in consulting for about four years uh, in the UK, Um, then um, moved to Cyprus, uh, an island in the uh, uh, eastern Mediterranean. Um, That was about 18 years ago. Uh, So I taught geotechnical engineering uh, at a university here for about 10 years. Also uh, set up um, a company called Geofem. Uh, that uh, specializes in uh, geotechnical uh, FEA. Um, Then about five years ago, uh, became global application technology manager at Tensar uh, as well. Uh, So regarding what I do day to day, um, so uh, at at Tensar that is uh, doing um, FEA of of geogrid applications, uh, more particularly developing new ways of, uh, of um, simulating geogrid applications in, um, in FEA. Um, that also leads to developing uh, new design methods using more conventional methods. So that includes uh, a new design method for unpaved roads that, uh, that I've just developed and that's being implemented into the, uh, the Tensile Plus uh, design app. Uh, regarding uh, Geofem, I continue to run uh, Geofem. Um, we have a team that do um, geotechnical uh, FEA work on projects uh, all over the world. So I review that and uh, review reports going out for that. Um, we also have a team doing satellite uh, image analysis for geotechnical applications. So I contribute to the geotechnical interpretation of the data that comes out of those analyses uh, before we send the results out. And um, ah, and uh, not to forget, um, the, I present the vlog, uh, Tensile Ground Coffee, 
a few minutes on ground engineering to enjoy it while having your coffee, if you don't mind me putting in that little plug there. Oh, awesome. Uh, well, my own blog. We'll make sure we get that in the show notes. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so with all that said, I guess you have, what, a 26-hour day, 27-hour? I mean, I don't know how you're getting all in 24 pretty hours. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. And uh, you, you mentioned FEA. What can you say about uh, FEA? For those that might not be familiar with that, um, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. And uh, how does it impact what we do as engineers? Um, well, FEA stands for Finite Element Analysis, and it exists in all fields of engineering. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the, the top of the tree in terms of the calculation methods uh, that we use in design. And it's particularly useful in geotechnical design because it's a very powerful analysis tool, it allows us to analyze the very complex material behavior of um, soil and, and rock. So we have uh, constitutive models that take into account nonlinear non stiffness, nonlinear strength, take into account the effect of drainage, different permeabilities, consolidation, um, construction sequences, uh, stress state, stress history, stress path, all those things can be incorporated into, into an FEA model. Um, so regarding, um, well, it's, it's benefits for construction. Um, well, you, you, FEA is a very powerful tool. Um, so you need to be competent to use it, first of all. So if it's, you, if it's in the right hands, it can bring um, significant economies in design but you don't use it uh, unless you really need to uh, because it takes longer to use than the conventional um, calculation methods but in situations where it is needed and there are many uh, just generally when things get complicated regarding geometry loading conditions soil behavior things like that that's when FEA can come in I've, I can think of one example where FEA did bring a big benefit to a geotechnical project a few years ago we worked on uh, the design of a a raft foundation for a new building at a university in the UK that was going to be supported on chalk. So chalk rock, pretty easy to work with, wasn't going to present any problems. But when they did the site investigation, they found old mine workings and possible solution features. So the top of the chalk uh, varied and went very deep into these features and there was non-engineered fill across most of the footprint of this raft and very variable with some soft areas, some stiff areas. So designers had tried to predict the settlement of this raft uh, using conventional methods um, that weren't suited, that the assumptions of those weren't suited to this complexity. And they were getting predictions of three or four inches of settlement, which wasn't acceptable for this building that had a glass facade. It had quite a tight uh, settlement limit uh, on it. Um, so they were going to have to go to piled foundations, which would have meant additional costs of about a million dollars to put all the, the, the piles into this site. Eventually, the structural engineer came to us. We did a 3D FEA model of the site. And because it had been investigated so intensively, uh, we were able to recreate the geometry of this infill in three dimensions with all the different properties, plus place the raft on the top to take into account the the load spreading ability of the of the raft. And with that, we were getting predictions of settlement of about half an inch compared to about the three inches that the, they were getting before. So on the strength of that, they decided not to go to piled foundations. So that's a good example of where we saved the client uh, a lot of time um, and also about a million dollars worth of additional piling, which was entirely down to the calculation method. So it's a good example of where it can bring benefits to construction. That makes a lot of sense. And, you know, a lot of times we're, we're thinking about, you know, material that's not going in the ground. So from a sustainability standpoint or ESG, environmental social governance, it's like we're not putting things in the ground that aren't going to get used and aren't needed. Uh, Absolutely. But you, you, you set a key there that when it's put in the right hands. You know, yeah, exactly. One of the challenges, you know, just when you think about FEA, one of the challenges is that you can do an analysis a lot quicker, but is it right? So make yeah, sure it's in the right hands. That's very I think important, that, yeah. Yeah, you know, a question I would say is, you know, what advice do you have to young engineers that are starting out in FEA? Some of them are starting out in grad school, work towards a PhD. Others are, you know, they might be at a consulting firm. Like what, what advice do you have for them when they're starting out as it relates yeah. to ge a geotechnical engineer, I should say? Yeah, 
Well, it's a common situation. Um, uh, a graduate uh, geotech arrives at a company. They're the ones that tend to be given the FEA software. They say, okay, you just, you're straight out of uni. You know how this thing works. <laughs> and that's in a situation I found myself in after finishing the PhD. But it's a daunting task because, yes, you've learned a bit at university, but there's still a lot more that you need to learn. And you need to learn that while you're at work. You can't get all that at university. So, um, so if you work at a, one of the larger uh, engineering firms, you probably have the expertise in-house available to you to, for advice and mentoring and so on. But often um, uh, uh, junior engineers are in smaller firms where there is no expertise in-house. Um, so that is a real challenge. Um, but fortunately, there are the learning resources available now more than there used to be. Um, so in particular, there's a, there's a very good textbook I would say that because I wrote it, but, but, but I wrote it specifically for that purpose for a junior engineer starting out in FEA. Uh, and the way the book is structured is it's full of questions and answers. It's full of the questions that I've heard over the years from people starting out in FEA. And that's the format of the whole book. It's just it's frequently asked questions uh, throughout the, the whole book. So it's quite a popular uh, textbook for giving someone the grounding and the knowledge that they need to do FEA. But there are other resources available as well. So that book in part came out of a European project I was working on called Kogan, which developed uh, new um, uh, learning resources and, and resources to manage competency in uh, geotechnical uh, numerical analysis. So that included some e-learning courses that are available on Udemy uh, free of charge. Uh, we developed a competency framework that lists all the competencies that someone needs to have to get started uh, with FEA. That's now managed by NAFEMS. NAFEMS is an international association that manages engineering analysis in, across all fields of engineering. Um, on ISS MGE website, there are, um, there are webinars and there's the virtual university. There are those resources. NAFEMS has more books. So there are plenty of resources out there and I'm afraid a lot of it does involve private study and there aren't the courses that cover all this detail but coming back to what you said Jared just now is the most important thing that I would tell someone starting out on this is be suspicious of your output so you might use the program and follow all the directions in the manual and you get an output and it looks fantastic with all the colored plots and you just think how can this possibly be wrong but no I will you should be suspicious. You should think that the output is always wrong. And that will actually encourage you to go to seek um, advice from perhaps non-specialists in FEA. So some people starting out in small companies have this issue where they don't have the expertise in FEA, but it's highly unlikely they're going to be working in an organization where there's no geotechnical expertise. <laughs> so you can, still, you can still show this output to an expert and say, look, I'm predicting this settlement and it's going to take about a month to occur. Does that look realistic to you? And he might say, yeah, the settlement looks about right, but not a month. I would expect it to take about five years. Have a look at your permeabilities and consolidation. So you can still get good feedback even from, from non-specialists of FEA if you ask the right questions. Very good, very good. Uh, a lot to think about. I mean, in the case that you gave before, it's like, is the mat going to settle three inches? Is it going to settle a half inch? Which one's right? I mean, that's 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 a it's a huge difference, right? <laughs> Trying to yeah. figure out which one is right. So uh, mm -hmm. I like that concept of being suspicious. Be suspicious yeah. and be curious. Mm -hmm. What would you say? You you alluded to geogrids earlier, geogrid reinforcement. What yeah. would you say is the biggest revolution in, in recent years in geogrid geogrid reinforcement? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. You use the word reinforcement there. That that's that's. That's part of the issue where there's a lot more to geogrid than just the reinforcement. Mm. So if, if anyone that's done FEA with geogrid applications, whether that's a reinforced saw wall or a, a working platform for, for a crane, for example, if you're able to back analyze a monitored field study, you'll always find that it under predicts performance. There's some missing element to this. So it, if you just model the soil and the geogrid as a tensile uh, membrane element, which is what the manual tells you to do, 
there's something missing. You, you're not getting the true performance. And that's how I got involved with Tensar. So they knew for, for many years that there was some additional function of GeoGrid that wasn't taken into account in, in both FEA and conventional design methods. So they asked uh, me initially to have a look at this to see if, if there was a way of characterizing what they called stabilization. So they knew this function stabilization existed, but there wasn't a way of putting numbers to it. So we did some investigation. We did large uh, triaxial testing and um, looked into the, the problem. And what, what we found, interestingly, that when you get shear deformation in a soil, um, you, obviously you get movement of the particles within an aggregate. So they move over each other. So they resist that by interparticle friction, but you get rotation of particles as well. That's very important. And often people don't appreciate the importance of the particle rotation in the soil strength. That's why an angular particles in a soil matrix are stronger than round particles because the round particles just rotate more easily and allow shear deformation. If you introduce a geogrid into that matrix, it acts as a disruptor to that movement of the particles. So particles that interlock with the geogrid are restrained against rotation and movement and they transfer that throughout the layer by interlock. So you're actually fundamentally changing the mechanical behavior of that aggregate. In fact, you're improving it. So that's why the performance is more than the sum of the parts. It's not just the aggregate plus reinforcement. It's actually changing the properties of the, the aggregate and making it stronger. So we developed a constitutive model. Um, it, we needed to develop a new one because the, the strength envelope is quite non-linear. So we developed that. And when we back analyzed, um, real field studies, finally, we were starting to get realistic predictions. Mm. So that really changed the way that, that we, we look at uh, the way geogrids uh, perform. So that led to developing new geogrids. So Tensar just uh, produced Interax, a, a new, new product. And it also improved our understanding of the application. So that led to new design methods, such as the T-value method that we use for crane platforms and piling platforms. We have a new railroad design method, and there's the unpaved one that, uh, that I just mentioned as well. And the ISO standard on geosynthetics now recognize stabilization as a, as an, a function of geogrid. So I would say that's the biggest revolution in, in geo, geogrid technology. It's not just reinforcement, it's the mechanical stabilization as well. That is exciting. That is exciting. And, and I understand that, that INSAR is growing fast in the geotechnical field. Can you explain to our listeners that might not be familiar with it, what it is, how does it work? Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, well, INSA is a, a fantastic technology and it's, as you say, it, it's growing fast. People are uh, rapidly uh, appreciating the, the, the applications of it in geotechnical engineering. And we, that's what we use in Geofem a lot is, um, is INSA to produce uh, outputs of, of ground and building displacement. So you, you have um, satellites 500 miles above the Earth's surface, and they're measuring displacements to fractions of an inch or millimeters on the ground. So just on its own, when you think about that, that's quite remarkable. Yeah. But how it does it is, briefly, is um, they are radar satellites. So they operate like a radar. They send out an electromagnetic pulse that hits the Earth's surface and different objects will reflect that back. And that's called backscatter. And that is received by the satellite, just like conventional radar works. And the satellite keeps passing over the same point again and again. Uh, intervals vary, but let's say every week they'll pass over the same point, take another radar image, and they can detect uh, displacements, movements of that of the whatever they are uh, getting backscatter from on the ground surface. Uh, so it detects the, the displacement, not by measuring the change in distance from the satellite to the ground surface, the 500 miles. What it does is it detects uh, a phase difference in the backscatter. So the wavelengths of these electromagnetic pulses are typically about a one inch, a few centimeters. So if you can detect fractions of phase difference between them, then you're already getting measurements of displacements of fractions of an inch or uh, uh, one or two centimeters. But more recent technology 
is analyzing stacks of images. So you take at least 20 images, taken one after another. It does a lot of complex analysis of that, and that eliminates more of the errors. And that means you can get displacements down to millimeter uh, accuracy. Uh, so the, the applications in geotechnical engineering and the implications are enormous. You can use that in, in site investigation. So um, right away, you've got a site, you can get data for displacement for that site for the previous five plus years, right off the bat. Or you can use it as a monitoring tool. So after construction, you can continue to monitor large structures, large geotechnical structures. You can monitor infrastructure, for example, on an ongoing basis uh, to check for defects, to check uh, your designs. And it's really valuable as a forensic tool. So imagine you've had some sort of failure and there was no monitoring of that failure, no data. Is there a way of turning back the clock and trying to get the displacement data before the accident happened? Well, the only way to do that is with INSAR because these satellites are taking images of the entire Earth's land surface every week. So that data is all archived. So wherever your site is, this data is available whenever you need it. So you can look at displacements leading up to uh, whatever you're investigating retrospectively. So amazing. it's a very powerful tool. That's amazing. And what is the, I mean, what is the output? Is it a mesh? Is it a point cloud? Is it, you know, individual points? Like what, what is it? Like, well, what, what, what are you, what are you getting? Like if I have a site that's, I don't know, an acre large and I locate it on inside, like what am I actually pulling from that? You, uh, you can get uh, point data, so mm -hmm. different colored points that will give you the displacement. Uh, that's how it's presented. Uh, or a raster plot, which is a, more like a contour plot. We, that's normally presented on an optical image. So even though optical image was not used in, the, in obtaining the data, it's often presented on an optical image. So you can associate where you are with uh, what's actually on the, on the site. It's normally presented on a GIS platform. Uh, that makes it easy to access all this data because there's a lot of data and you can click on any location and you can plot graphs of the displacement over the past five years, every week. Um, and also you can even detect changes in soil moisture. And that's, that could be, that will be very useful in, in geotechnical engineering um, because uh, of course, a lot of issues are caused by soil moisture uh, as, uh, as much as displacement. Definitely. Wow, that's really cool. So I think this is a good segue for my next question. What does the future look like for geotechnical engineers? In your opinion, I mean, what, what's on the horizon? Um, I think the future looks good. I think we'll be in demand. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. <laughs> that's good. It's good for us. <laughs> for folks like yeah. you and I, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's good for the next generation. I mean, the, the challenges that we'll have to face and the next generation will face are, are numerous, but... Uh, one in particular is, um, is the, the legacy infrastructure that we have, particularly in the developed world. So we have uh, all, this, uh, all these highways and railways and other infrastructure that are getting old now and they're developing defects. Um, they're, they've suffered from underinvestment for, for many years. Uh, hopefully that's going to improve uh, soon. There are signs that that's improving. Uh, they're getting heavier use than ever before, often heavier use than they were designed for. That would be a challenge enough. But on top of all that, we've got climate change. And that just looks like it's going to get worse for, for years to come. So we are facing greater extremes of weather. That means the geotechnical assets are going to be more susceptible to uh, geohazards, such as landslides, uh, expansive clays, uh, sinkholes, uh, and so on. Uh, so we face an enormous task trying to maintain and improve the resilience of this infrastructure to these, uh, these, growing, um, these growing issues. Now, if we're going to tackle all that individually as geotech engineers, well, there just aren't enough of us. So visual inspection of all these assets takes a, a, a very long time. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of miles of existing assets that we need to monitor. Uh, to assess their condition. So this is where we're going to need technology. So I can see technology growing a lot uh, in the geotechnical sector. So it, it's, it's good for the next generation to 
to start using this and get familiar with this and, and take it forward. INSAR is going to be a very valuable tool here. It's, it's already being used uh, to, to monitor infrastructure. So you can, you can survey whole networks or most of uh, the network in an instant every week. And you can get displacement data, even changes in soil moisture for your geotechnical assets every week. So you can pinpoint problem areas even before they become visual, uh, visible to the naked eye. Uh, and you can detect trends. You could even uh, predict um, when a, a defect might develop. So you can, you can make in interventions in a more proactive way. So proactive interventions are, are quicker, cheaper, and much more cost-effective, uh, less disruptive. It might be something as simple as fixing the drainage because you've detected an increase in soil moisture or a, an increase in a few millimeters of displacement. Instead of doing reactive maintenance where you wait until you've got a real problem uh, and the, the defect becomes visually apparent and then the, 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 the maintenance becomes uh, much more expensive and disruptive. So the future looks bright uh, in summary and it's, it's gonna need technology for us to deal with these challenges and, and good geotech engineers. Uh, it sounds like a lot of opportunity. It sounds like a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I'm thinking about absolutely. different, you know, clients or agencies or entities that have access to like a lot of assets, and you're trying to figure out from a budgeting standpoint what's going to be priority, right? And that that sounds mm -hmm. like the tools are there to figure out where to focus. You know? Yeah, yeah. So that's great. Well, before we take our break, our break, uh, what's the final piece of advice you'd like to give some of the younger engineers that are listening about how to get more involved in these fields of geotech? Um, you, um, well, you, you can see the opportunities there. So yeah, I, I certainly recommend it as a career. Uh, um, I've done well out of the, the, the career. Uh, if you're interested, yeah, go for, go for, go to grad school, go to go for postgraduate study. You need to get that, uh, that ground. You, you need to get that. Uh, <laughs> you've got to get that, uh, yeah, that background, um, knowledge. And then, uh, yeah, choose what field uh, you want to get to. I mean, if I tell you why I got into geotechnical engineering, maybe that uh, that might uh, help some people uh, thinking about it. When I back when I was studying civil engineering, uh, I remember year two uh, soil mechanics, and um, boy, the soil mechanics was tough. There were sigma dashes and U's flying everywhere. This new terminology and <laughs> oh boy, when I when I did the exam, I, I got a good grade, but I got better grades in other things, structural yeah. engineering and, uh, and, uh, and other, other topics. But I wasn't the only one. Everybody was finding this subject difficult. So I thought, ah, okay, everyone finds this difficult. So if I crack this, um, I'm going to be in demand because none of these other guys are interested. They don't want to understand it. So so I went into a further study, uh, did a PhD. Um, so I, I see that now when, when I talk to other civil engineers that don't have this specialization, they, they, they need help. They're, 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 when they get difficult ground conditions, they're scared. They, they don't understand it. They don't know what to do. They, they, they need our help. But if you do go, into, uh, if you do go to grad school, I, I would recommend looking for opportunities to teach. Um, so if, if you can just teach a, a lab class, a field trip, or even do some lecturing, that's really valuable. Uh, I recommend going, going for that, even if it might disrupt your, your studies a little bit. The, the best way to learn something is to teach it, because you, you need to know it so fundamentally. And if you're going to teach it well, you need to understand it. Anybody can read from a textbook, but if you're, if you're listening to a teacher that is reading from a textbook, you know they don't understand what they're trying to teach you, and it's an instant turnoff. If they yeah. understand it really well and they can just teach it without the textbook, uh, you, you gain so much more from that. And as a as a student, but also teaching it, you 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 don't lose that knowledge. It, it's a really good way to, to learn. So that, that's another piece of advice I would give. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're going to come back in just a minute and close this one out and Andrew in our career factor safety end segment. Stick around.
Welcome back. It's time for our career factor safety end segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Andrew Lees, PhD, MICE, CENG, and Director of GeoFEM and Global Application Technology Manager at Tensar International. Andrew, you've already had a very successful career. When you look back on your career, what's one thing you implemented to give yourself a career factor of safety? Oh, I like that. I, uh, I haven't heard of that before. A career factor of safety. That's good. Um, I would say that the thing that stood me in good stead is, is this. It's, it's good to know a lot about a little rather than to know a little about a lot. Now, what I mean by that is it's good to specialize. So you may have generalists who may know a lot about uh, the fields of geology, civil engineering, geotechnical engineering, and they're, and they're great and they're very useful to the industry. But what I have done is to specialize. So I did the PhD, got into geotechnical FEA, um, became specialized in that. Even now, specializing in geotechnical FEA of geogrid applications, we're getting narrower and narrower. So knowing more and more about less and less. It's good to know a lot about a little because when you become a specialist, people always want to talk to you. They always want to ask you questions. It's the same in the medical profession. If you've got a problem, some part of your body, you want to see a specialist. But often it's difficult to see a specialist because everybody wants to see a specialist. It's the same in geotechnical engineering. So uh, yeah, what stood me in good stead is uh, yeah, specialization. Excellent. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on the show and for sharing so many great insights with us. Uh, we're going to have things in the show notes about some of the things you talked about, some of those resources. You shared a lot of great information and advice is going to be helpful to our listeners. But where can listeners find you? you have an email you want to share or you're on social media? Feel free to let me know. Uh, I'm on, yep, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, people can okay. find me there. You can get in touch with me there. Um, or through the GeoFem website, there, there's, uh, there's contacts uh, there. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com where you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode 50, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Until next time, we wish you the very best in all your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.